So, the title of my talk is Topographies of Hope, and it was originally called Counter Topography, Seeking Common Grounds in Global Processes, and that, so the first section of the talk is going to be about that, and then I'm going to talk about hope, and then kind of combine the two and think about the commons and other radical spaces where we can imagine remaking the world, which is in desperate need of remaking by people like you. So, it's uh, space, not time, that hides consequences from us. Uh, art critic and novelist John Berger famously noted, the ref that reflection and its compelling spatio-temporality has inspired and driven my thinking for many years. It spurred a variety of projects bent on unhiding. I say unhiding rather than finding, because while consequences are not completely knowable and the ways they unfold in space and time are unpredictable, much of what we don't grasp is willed unknowing, a refusal to see. Now more than ever, and certainly more than when Berger wrote, consequences of all manner of events and actions, no matter where in the world they occur, no matter what scale they occur, can be known intimately, graphically, viscerally. The images of the Bahamas devastation in the wake of last week's hurricane, or the near daily images of asylum seekers struggling to find safe harbors all over the world are widely available in all kinds of media. But we often let, let, um, let space hide these consequences of actions rooted elsewhere. But even when they're close at hand, encampments of homeless people and refugee settlements are consequences of rapacious real estate development and state violence that those responsible often refuse to see or see as consequences of other things, not of their making. Space still hides consequences then. And at the same time, the temporal horizons of, of unfolding critical issues such as climate change recede in the gloaming, its consequences occluded in time, Berger's aphorism notwithstanding. Unhiding the consequences, whether in space or time, is a political project, and one that asks how to work across differences of scale, site, nation, and locality to find common grounds of practices and imagination. For me, these are ways to excavate and create spaces of hope. Several years ago, I developed the idea of counter topography to point to these common effects of macro level processes in disparate locations. And I have to say that um, this, the genesis for this, and I feel like the genesis for lots of, at least the, my paper titles, come from me feeling like, how dare you say that to me? So, um, but this one was from a conference at Berkeley um, Call, and the session I was invited to be part of was called um, Topographies of Race and Gender. And I thought, well, that's a sexy title that um, I have no idea what it means, and I doubt the person who called it that knew what it meant. And um, we who are geographers are sometimes touchy about the ways geographic uh, metaphors are put into play, and that seemed like one of them. I also had no idea what a topography was. So I actually looked it up and figured it out and um, thought that I could connect um, places along these contour lines. I knew what a topographic map was and um, I thought, oh, and this shows that I am a, a really not a great physical geographer. Oh. <laughs> I thought, oh, where I worked in Sudan was flat, and where I work in New York is flat, never thinking that they are 2,000 meters different elevation. I, so I just like sort of deployed this metaphor and uh, ran with it. But um, flat is not the point. 
<laughs> so, but I thought that the analytic connections between the places in, the, in terms of de-skilling of children in the, in the you know, shift from an agricultural to a, a more capitalist uh, cash cropping agriculture and an industrial economy and then what was happening in New York as a result of disinvestment in industry and a um, kind of financialized service economy. And in both cases, children were not being prepared for the worlds in which they were growing up. And it seemed to me that making that kind of contour line was a way to insist on uh, globalization understood in a different way. Um, people, since I've been here, have asked me, did I think of that before, uh, before I went to do the work in New York? And I didn't. Um, so it's a, a more of a retrospective way of linking places and then a, a way of thinking about that in a bigger sense, which is what I'm going to talk about. So um, what I argued was that drawing out the common grounds and entanglements of processes like global economic restructuring, state violence, de-skilling, and dispossession, as they played out in distinct places, in disparate places, places you don't imagine connecting, like rural Sudan and urban New, uh, US, um, that that would offer a different kind of geographical imagination for political organizing. I thought of counter topography both as a spatial metaphor with multiple entailments and as a methodology intended to both excavate the sedimentations of processes that produce particular places and reveal their intersections with material social practices at other sites and other scales of analysis. Counter topography then is a mode of relational comparison connecting distinct sites analytically, methodologically, and politically. Its contour lines intend, are intended to incite new political imaginaries and spur alternative geographies of action and activism, potentially spaces of hope in an expanded field. Am I talking too fast? Berlin is so New York, and New York is aspires to be Berlin. <laughs> They're both losing out to real estate, but that's another <laughs> matter entirely. Um, counter topography and why it is counter hinges on an understanding of topography and its various uses. Topography, as most geographers know, is at once the description of a place or landscape and the landscape itself. Tracing the effects of a material social process such as global economic restructuring as it is etched on particular grounds produces uh, a critical topography. And then summoning, as I've mentioned, one of the key features, features of topographical maps, the contour lines, um, a counter topography is a way to connect far-flung localities to reveal an assemblage of sites experiencing similar effects of particular process and a way of con to connect sites opposing destructive or unjust processes and possibly galvanizing new modes of responding to them in different settings and across settings. For example, the displacements of gentrification may be understood differently and productively if a contour line is drawn connecting places experiencing gentrification to areas confronting displacement caused by other means, such as rural development, dam construction, state violence, or toxic exposure. How is displacement and, and, or dispossession experienced and addressed in these different settings as a result of these different kinds of problems? So I'm not trying to, and I certainly don't want to, un, um, universalize or homogenize settings or problems, but to find common grounds and, and often unexpected ones that shape relationships between places around structural relationships. A counter topography offers a geographical imagination that is translocal and transnational, a way to imagine politics that acknowledges the distinctness of place and its internal contradictions and particular histories, while recognizing that it's at the same time analytically connected to other places along these contour lines that represent not elevation, but rather particular relations to processes. 
like racialized violence or asylum seeking, where responses may differ, but in the topographical encounter, they can cross-fertilize, inspire one another, get shared, extend their reach, and incite new action and praxis in multiple elsewheres. These are the makings of spaces of hope. Inspired by Inderpal Grewal and Karen Kaplan's notion of scattered hegemonies and Michel Rofe Triot's concept of fragmented globality and of a piece with imagined political geographies such as archipelagos, such as those written about by Paul Amar or Alison Mounts, or Marston Jones and Woodward's notion of site ontologies, or what Paul Rutledge develops as convergent spaces, and then resonating with the activism of such organizations as La Via Campesina, the Shack or Slum Dwellers International, um, Global People's Action, and Foil Vendanta, among many others. And since I've been here for the last few days, there's lots of localized counter topographies, I think, of cross-fertilization um, across housing struggles, but also against displacement and for things like um, community spaces for arts and activism. Um, these counter, these organizations and, the, and, their, and what I'm calling counter topography offers a geographical imagination of connection, of solidarities despite inferred distinction, and, of the, and the sorts of mobility that might produce a life politics at once global and intimate, distinctive and general, reaching toward and creating new spaces of hope that don't claim universalism but rather net networked or associational aspirations and actions. It's both a, a theoretical and methodological intervention, and I'm um, thrilled to, to realize that it's been taken up by a diverse group of interdisciplinary scholars to reimagine various um, geographies of neoliberal globalization, migration, violence, in a, in a different register than, than than I had seen before. And their work offers all kinds of insights suggesting creative possibilities for organizing as well as theorizing. But given the nature of academic research and the urgency of activist interventions around social and environmental justice, there are li limits to the ways these ideas have been mobilized in theory and in practice. For instance, while many writers have worked on the ideas associated with counter topography, illuminating global connections around issues like families, citizenship, and warfare, like um, asylum and state violence, like domestic violence in diaspora, like gender and the environment, I'm not naming the authors, I can tell you later, and water governance. They generally work on tracking the connections among places by way of single issues. Large though most of these issues are, and they are, they do not press upon places in a solitary way, and the ways they compound and interact with other issues can be key to mobilizing responses, locating hotspots of concern, and finding spaces of hope in places that have like layers of different problems but aren't all the same, and so kind of contour lines that are more um, dis dispersed and, and varied. Um, they are understandably, li there's little opportunity for any one scholar, any scholar activist, or group to work across counter topographies to illuminate potential nodal points or densities around sets of concerns or concatenations of problems. Also, while activists, activists and scholar activists have made some compelling transnational connections across issues, locating and creating what Paul Routledge refers to as convergence spaces, much of this work is necessarily through virtual means and the occasional international gathering or conference. There are few opportunities for face-to-face -face gatherings of activists working the contour lines of common causes globally and in a way, this points to a key problem associated with constructing counter topographies. Their insights often remain abstract, in large part because so much practice is resolutely and necessarily local 
and its urgencies so demanding, it's hard to jump scale or connect translocally. And yet, in some concrete way or another, it's important to do so, given capitalism's mobility and site, the site-crossing mutabilities of racisms, sexisms, colonial and imperialist practices, which get away with murder, quite literally, in their translocal slinkiness and abilities to secret their consequences across settings. Perhaps one way to make these translocal oppositional practices more visible would involve more active representation and more creativity in making the connections among them. So while scholars and practitioners in geographic information science and the digital humanities have indicated an interest in developing visual tools to, in, um, to represent and illuminate these sorts of connections, their substantive overlaps and their possibilities for policy and action, this hasn't been done yet, um, despite the tantalizing prospects of it for revealing and creating spaces of hope and extending the vital practices that produce them and make them visible. So if anyone here is a GI person, GI science person, as opposed to GI tract, um, I would love you to start showing <laughs> all these connections in some magical way. And I know that um, there's a group here in the back <laughs> who are about to do this in, in uh, January with a different project. And um, we could talk about that later. At the same time, there are many exciting international and translocal connections being made all the time. Social activists working around the world have been inventive and strategic in fostering the sorts of translocal connections that make the heart of counter topography beat. For example, International pe Peasants Movement, La Via Campesina, brings together farmers and agricultural workers organizations from around the world to struggle for small-scale sustainable agriculture, food sovereignty, uh, land reform, and the opposition to genetically modified seeds and the overuse of toxic chemicals in agriculture. They're also against free trade agreements and the WTO. At the same time, they extend their reach to organize against violence against women. So they're embracing different issues that come their way and that they find in different, or have found in different places where they work. The Shacks or Slum Dwellers International is a network of organizations of poor people living in cities around the world without benefit of formal housing. SDI fosters direct connections among people living in informal settlements to exchange knowledge, strategy, experience, and skills that will enhance their visibility and claim to a right in the city, uh, to the city. Over 30 community-based organizations in Africa, Asia, South and Central America, and the Caribbean are active members of SDI. Extending their reach to the global north would shine an important light on the interlinked circuitry of capitalism's global depredations. Without erasing the differences between the global north and south, it's perilous to not imagine the nature of their translocal connections around homelessness and displacement. Um, people's global action, for instance, brings together um, social movements working against neoliberal capitalism in ways that respect differences of local historical geographies but seek alliances and networked solution. Um, it seems like a contour line from the SDI people to Kuvri Bracha would have, might have been helpful in maintaining that space of hope along the spray. We saw what's growing up there now and it's global. Um, so another grassroots transnational solidarity movement is Foil Vendanta, which works in a different way than uh, Shack Dwellers or Via Campesina, in that its contour lines travel across the various sites where British mining corporation Vendanta works, but it also connects struggles in these sites to activist interventions in the UK around mining and its international entailments. The experiences, practices, 
and challenges of grassroots organizations such as these in negotiating complicated place-based struggles while engaging their translocal aspirations are critical to understand in building social movements that um, are at once global and intimate, sustainable and targeted. Their actions create contour lines for practice and trace topographies of hope. I'm also hoping that opportunities such as this summer school and other practice-oriented adventure, uh, adventures, adventures will, um, it is kind of an adventure though, um, will allow the exchange of ideas and experiences among diverse groups of academics who have drawn on and, and advanced the kinds of ideas I associate with counter topography, making connections across national and transnational space, activists who have worked these connections in their practice to create translocal re um, relationships around specific issues such as displacement or environmental degradation, NGOization or the nonprofit industrial complex, precarity or agrarian reform. And also adding to those two groups, uh, specialists in cartography, visual representation, ge geographic information science and the digital humanities who can produce maps and other graphic materials that will help academics and activists to envision the co these connections in creative and generative ways assisting not only in visualizing potential contour lines across space and setting, but also revealing the intersections and knotted densities that might foster new solidarities and more expansive political engagements. These practices would illuminate what we can think of as spaces of hope, or at least illuminate the contours of political practices that might foster those spaces of hope or extend them. So hope. What of hope? I joked yesterday, it seems like that was three years ago, that um, I, was, I could find hope for a week, or at least a few days here. Um, but I, I actually feel like from working on this and with all of you that it's an essential ingredient of politics and of maintaining our efforts in these heinous times. Um, so hope is not one of the terms I use in my work. Though practices of hope in a Blockian sense undergird my political imagination. Inspired by the title of this summer school and this invitation to speak, I decided to delve explicitly into thinking about hope, um, hope as a political imaginary and how spaces of hope might be materialized. I found much that dovetailed with the way I think about what I, what, the ways I think about counter topography and the nature and possibilities of contemporary political projects at a variety of scales. As a political stance, hope keeps our sights on the horizon of possibility, or perhaps more aptly, on the horizons of possibility, multiple and fluid, for there's no terminus to a politics of hope and no geographical fixity to its imagined spaces. Hope is a way of keeping in sight that something else is possible and that the reservoirs of that something else are in the present. To paraphrase C.L.R. James, the future is in the present. And to keep hope alive as various futures implode in disappointing and even devastating presents is to create the possibility of its collective making, different, better, more just, less painful, less unequal, which always will spark conflicts and contradictions. It's a never-ending struggle for justice to be sure, but also there's a palpable there on the, uh, and also there palpable on the horizon, a concrete possibility. For Bloch and others, hope is the antithesis of fear which represents a narrowing vision along with the passivity that comes of the defeatist shuddering of potentialities rooted in memory and history that say and too often repeat, something is not possible, or in Thatcher's most horrible phrase, there is no alternative. As queer theorist Jose Munoz framed it, hope is at once a methodology and a critical affect a mode of desiring that allows us to see and feel beyond the quagmire of the present. And it is a quagmire. 
all the more important, albeit all the more difficult, to not get stuck in the muck of it. I'm drawn to thinking about counter-topography entwined with this reading of hope in order to delineate some spaces of hope and geographical imaginations for political practice that are at once more grounded than the dreamscape David Harvey offers in his epilogue to Spaces of Hope. I, I really don't know what he was on when he wrote that. <laughs> but true to the impetus that drove his desire or fantasy about finding such spaces. He was out on a limb there. Well, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I kind of hoped that section would be over. Um, Harvey, writing around the 150th anniversary of the Manifesto of the Communist Party, was grappling with what is glossed as capitalist globalization and the despairing levels of inequality in its wake. Understanding this process in a relational and scalar way, Harvey ruminates on the connections between the body and the global, or what Geraldine Pratt and Victoria Rosner later and more sweepingly framed as the global and the intimate. For Harvey, among others, the body is, a, is relational, an unfinished project that is created, bounded, sustained, and ultimately dissolved in a spatio-temporal flux of multiple processes. But given his dialectical perspective, Harvey also understood that the body, any body, is simultaneously active in transforming itself, its environs, and the very processes that produce and make it legible. The laboring body, as well as what Deleuze and Guattari call a desiring machine, encounters, mediates, and shapes the social and material worlds it inhabits. Desire and its aspirational reach beyond the logics of what is given is key to imagining and creating spaces of hope. But so too is labor, always already social, produced and reproduced in a social matrix at once historical and geographical. In this sense, spaces of hope are of a piece with Bloch's ideas about concrete utopias, connected to historically and geographically situated collective struggles. He speaks of imagining a world without exploitation, wherein hopeful, hopeful dreamers overhaul the given world in action and dreams. Labor and imagination work together to create not only the spaces of everyday life, but new futures and the spaces of their possibilities. Along these lines, while I usually think of the contour lines of counter topographies as connecting places facing similar problems and engaging in struggles around them, with at least some of them mounting op oppositional practices that might be shared or at least inspire across settings, I, I have been spurred by this invitation and the work of the refiguration of spaces groups who, um, uh, what they're doing to also think about contour lines connecting active generative spaces of hope. Spaces produced by artists, artists collectives, pirate radio, graffiti writers, underground comics, mixtape makers, performance spaces, art squats, and now boat builders, um, both within cities and more broadly, including transnationally. Tracing vibrant alternatives is a key critical practice of hope, ma hope making and stretching in its reach, and thus its transformative possibilities. For Harvey, spaces of hope were first and foremost relational. The particular and the universal are not separable. Each is internalized and implicated in the other dialectically. This notion echoes Marxian understandings of the abstract and the concrete in that dialectic Knowledge is rooted in the concrete, exchanges with the material world, these struggles that I'm talking about, from where it moves and illuminates the abstract. Thus, the concrete struggles to carve out, reclaim, and expand spaces of hope, or what Bloch may call, might call concrete utopias, can shape and invigorate theoretical formations such as counter topography, stretch our geographical imaginations, and illuminate praxis. Drawing on Bloch, Harvey notes that hope rests on optimism, and then he doubles down on Gramsci, 
or perhaps liberates him from his prison cell in calling for an optimism of the intellect as well as an optimism of the will. He suggests that the inability to find that optimism impedes the development of radical politics, um, resources, and spaces of hope for change. He wrote in what felt like dire times, which are now worse in terms of inequality, injustice, environmental degradation, so all the more important to find and kindle optimism in our analyses and practice, even when it's sometimes so hard to do so. One way to do this is to recognize and unhide from the relations of power and domination that eclipse them the myriad struggles worldwide against capitalism, white supremacy, colonialism, imperialism, heteropatriarchy, racism, and ableism. The vibrancy and potentials of these political struggles, even when short-lived, are as important a focus now, if not more so, than the assaults on social and environmental justice that spur them. We know all too well what's wrong, and while careful analysis of the sprawl and intersections of political, economic, social, and cultural problems is important, solely focusing that way creates with it the danger of a presentist impasse, a topography of fear. Bloch refused that stuckness of the here and now, which imagined the present and its oppressive logics as always, as the always was and always will be, narrowing the channels imagined and material of escape. He was all about seeing the not yet here, drawing on the no longer conscious as resources of hope. These understandings and their political force are of a piece with Benjamin's ideas around collective wish images, which reach into and make history from the needs and concerns of the present to imagine and create something else, grasping the past from a moment of danger to see a future in the ways that inspire and call forth political action. And it's much longer than a moment of danger right now. The not yet here for Bloch was temporal, unfurling a future yet to come. But it can also be imagined spatially, a not here in a geographical sense, but perhaps there, now, and now there and in, a, in, and in that way a vista on what soon may be here, creating what we can think of as a topography of hope. Topographies of hope are the antithesis of topographies of fear and in many ways connect the politics of social reproduction and social reproduction as politics. The material social practices through which the world is made in everyday ways, often usually quite similarly to the day before, are critical social practices. They always create the space of possibility for something else to come into being something else to be made, new social relations and ways of thinking and acting that frame one space time and glimpse another. Spaces of hope are fields of possibility. They may not be long lasting, but if we, but if they are all, uh, if they are, they, but they are all around if we look. Our methodology of, of hope include their unhiding. Past instances can illuminate the making and, ma and unmaking of historical geographies of social, political, cultural transformation. Their threads of hope are often still dangling, ready to be picked up and woven anew. Kristen Ross's beautiful history of the Paris Commune, communal luxury, offers one such opportunity an excavated history for our times that shows another world was brought into existence and threatened the foundations of capitalism profoundly for a little while. It was while it lasted what Peter Leinbaum might call an exemplary suggestion for world making that refuses to be mired in an impossible same. In my work on contemporary childhood, I am grappling with these questions of social reproduction and world making from the other side. That is, where overwhelming insecurity about the future, whether it's geopolitical, environmental, political, economic, um, creates what are basically topographies of fear at all scales. 
And these fears, well-founded and understandable as they are, diminish, if not in destroy entirely, any sense of social childhood. By social childhood, I mean an imagined time space in which the capacities, dreams, and desires of everyone matter, and where their development ensures a shared and survivable future. In other words, the very essence of a space of hope. The, practical, uh, the material social practices in such spaces dance, and I do mean dance, not just at the local scale, but across differences of class, race, gender, and sexuality encompassing multiple sites. Making worlds in which all children have a chance and in which all children participate in their chance making and taking is what I mean by social childhood. But all too often, the fear metastasizes and the anxiety and insecurities it provokes push people inward, closing off paths of solidarity in the face of these problems, refusing the dance of imagining otherwise. The retreat, whether into racialized bunkered nationalisms or venal inter-household competition, even at the most privileged levels, perhaps at, always at the most privileged levels, and I don't know if the news of our college admission scandals have reached here, but all these movie stars paid hundreds of thousands of dollars to get their kids higher scores. One of them was actually quoted to, to um, give her a chance, give her a fighting chance. These kids are born fighting other people's chances. Um, and um, other kinds of things that happen in the name of this closed off fear would be closing collective projects of world making such as high quality public education, which um, we've done a very good job of at the, in the US. Um, it forecloses glimpsing different futures in the present and in Bloch-ian terms locks people into nothingness. Not only do the insecurities I've mentioned exacerbate inequality and injustice um, as they advance accumulation by dispossession in a range of registers and thus require resistance, but if we allow them to ground us into despair, we trade solidarity for solitary. Spaces of hope and its possibilities lost to spaces of fear. Hope, it's important to remember, is the mediated presence of possible futures in the here and now. Its mediation conjures and relies on social relations and practices over against individual aspiration. Commons of all kinds are, are, uh, and, uh, and all scales are premised in the sorts of mediation and, sur and survive through the sorts of concrete struggles I'm associating with topographies of hope. As spaces of hope, we might think of commons as time spaces, collectives, alternative, non-capitalist, non-patriarchal, anti-racial capitalists that are everywhere within, alongside, and underneath the dominant world. This realm of alternate sociality is always here and now, available to be entered and engaged if people think the possible instead of the likely, listen for the unheard of, as Peter Leinbach framed it, instead of the always already and still. These spaces of hope and possibility take work and play along with a willingness and openness to imagine new ways of thinking and being in the world. In this imagining of the commons, I found shared and inspiring grounds with Stefano Harney and Fred Moten's writings on the undercommons, which at one point they frame as a box, a box to be entered. Tellingly, it's Fred Moten's children who name the box. Dad, we have a box, and we're gonna let you open this box. And if you open the box, you can enter our world. As Moten continues, that's kind of what it feels like, there are these props, these toys, and if you pick them up, you can move into some new thinking and into new sets of relations, a new way of being together and thinking together. Who wouldn't open that box? These ideas, and, and I'm seeing that in all kinds of practices that I've been um, privileged to see during these few days here. Um, but these ideas resonate with my interests in everyday life, social reproduction, play as mimesis, and the productions and exchange of knowledge that Jean Lave and Etienne Wenger called communities of practice. 
the worlding of worlds collectively, playfully, imaginatively, perpendicularly, or at other angles, brings to mind childhood and the making, breaking dance of possibilities enacted there every day. A there and a then, that's not just a period in the life course, but a reservoir of possibilities we swim in and drink in all the time. Almost done. Um, <laughs> thinking about children, see, they speak for all of us. I know you're crying on the inside. Um, thinking about commons as spaces of hope and the sorts of futures that Bloch suggests are not yet here but are available for a sort of conjuring, playful mediation perhaps. I thought about a few books that grabbed my imagination as a child and realized that in each one, children entered other worlds, commons if you will, in the sense that they tripped upon radical other modes of sociality and these parallel universes were there. They were just there, ready to be found, entered, lingered in, and even dwelled in. Conjured by circumstances, sparking imagination, and enabled by creative guides and fellow travelers. In particular, I recalled three books that had stuck with me for more than 50 years. Upside Downtown, and you won't have heard of these, The Secret World of Og, and a volume of Mary Poppins in which the children enter the space between the years. A magical possibility I still think of every New Year's Eve. <laughs> I haven't gotten in there yet, but I'm, I'm optimistic. When I reread them thinking about this talk, I realized that in each one, the children, brothers and sisters, entered worlds, upside down, magical, fleeting where they found alternate social relations, transformed subjectivities, and wildly different cultural forms and practices, props for new thinking, and alternative ways of being together. These worlds, turned upside down, as a Diggers ballot put it, Diggers being the prefigurative anarchists of the 17th century, um, render decommodification sensible and exhilarating and engaged the more than human in new and wonderful ways. Their grip on my imagination for so many years speaks directly to the question that animates us here. When is she going to stop? Spaces of hope and with them the enduring power and possibility of what we might think about as under commons democracy. I'm certain that my political imagination was sparked or at least found its charge in these imagined worlds and their charms. Of a piece with the mimetic qualities of play outside of the box or otherwise, the pretending, the let's just be, the intrinsic pleasures and full imaginative freight of doing nothing, the thing we cannot let our children do now, the bourgeois child must do something every second. Um, the let's do that again and read it again and all fall down again and all the repetitions that are non-identical and each time new, performed relational and that hold, them in the in, hold in them the recognition that each act is in relation, is creative, is embodied, is representational and each time, each and every time could spark something new. In other words, social reproduction is a critical practice. Our own collaborative world making taking place, literally and figuratively, in historical geographies of gendered and racial capitalism, rent by debt, the ongoing violence of enclosure and privatization from the genetic to the extraplanetary, the scars and predations of accumulation by dispossession across site and scale, and the excesses waste and waste produced by these social relations can and must conjure something different make something different. There, in the material social practices of everyday life, in the multiple and shifting constellations of communities of practice and shared study across contour lines of dispersed possibilities for experimentation, are the wild imaginings, the refusals of misery, as Harney and Moten put it, the songs and the struggles to make worlds we can live in and even love. These practices are ever present holdouts against enclosure and privatization, not vestiges of prior cultural forms and practices. They represent a different kind of commons, not one of waste or remnant, but of resistance, refusal, and hope. 
If we recognize these common aspirations and imagination and the more than human en engagements that characterize them along with the new ways they strive to shape subjectivities able to meet a world of others, human and not, then we can at least see the possibilities of the commons around us, the coexisting worlds we might find and found and dwell in with radically other social relations of production, reproduction, time, space, work, play, and study. These spaces of hope are there, here, everywhere. Concrete utopias in the making, ready to be entered and fought for, to want, to engage, reimagine, and struggle over, to aspire to with actions that might have a chance of remaking the world. Thank you.